these lines which we, we read last week and which we are going to continue reading um, this afternoon uh, refer back to the, the mind which is the, the regent it is ruling us instead of our soul or in the place of our soul the deputy of our soul he describes the mind as um, a vice regent or a regent and he's been telling us about this surface mind that we have which knows no silence no dreamless sleep it is always active even when we are asleep if we wake up we may not remember anything but the mind normally has been active almost all the time we stopped um, last time at the line that says um, only a moment he spends in silent self we need to sleep seven or eight or nine hours a night just to allow the being to have a moment of contact with the deep silent self I'm going to read on from there and then we'll go back and look at each sentence in detail. Adventuring into infinite mind space, he unfolds his wings of thought in inner air. Or traveling in imagination's car, crosses the globe, journeys beneath the stars, to subtle worlds, takes his ethereal course, visits the gods on life's miraculous peaks, communicates with heaven, tempers with hell. This is the little surface of man's life. He is this and he is all the universe. He scales the unseen. His depths dare the abyss. A whole mysterious world is locked within. unknown to himself he lives a hidden king behind rich tapestries in great secret rooms an epicure of the spirits unseen joys he lives on the sweet honey of solitude a nameless God in an unapproachable fane in the secret additum of his inmost soul he guards the beings covered mysteries beneath the threshold behind shadowy gates or shut in vast cellars of inconscient sleep. The immaculate, divine, <clears throat> all wonderful casts into the argent purity of his soul, his splendor and his greatness and the light of self-creation in time's infinity as into a sublimely mirroring glass man in the world's life 
works out the dreams of God. I'm going to pause there, we'll look at those lines and then we'll read on further. Suresh will start today. Yeah. Her conjuring into infinite mind space, he unfolds his wings of thought in inner air, uh, traveling in imagination's curve, crosses of globe, journeys, beneath the stars, to stubble, subtle, subtle words take his ethereal course, visits the gods on life's miraculous peaks. Communicates with heaven, tempers with hell. Yes. So we remember this, he is our mind. Hmm? And that mind, uh, either while we are asleep or when we are not occupied with daily life, uh, it goes adventuring, the mind goes wandering. It goes wandering in mind space. Hmm? And in order to uh, adventure, to travel about and have adventures in the mind space, he, he has wings. He unfolds his wings of thought in inner air. You, you can notice your mind doing this. If you want to think about anything, it can even fly to the furthest edges of the universe. It can open its uh, wings of thought and fly in inner air. No? Or we use often imagination. It's not just the power of thought, but we imagine things. We um, we put together thoughts and in this way as if in a, in a car, a chariot or a wonderful plane uh, we can cross the globe, we can go, we can think ourselves in Africa or Antarctica or anywhere, no? Or we can go out away from the earth atmosphere, journey beneath the stars explore the solar system, or we can even go to the subtle worlds, the subtle physical worlds, the vital worlds, the, the other worlds that are there in the inner universe. So in that way, the mind even is able to visit the gods up on the highest levels of life, those miraculous peaks, a peak is the top of the mountain, no? there uh, on those highest levels of mind, miraculous things can happen. The mind can communicate with heaven, the higher levels of consciousness, and it can also visit hell. It can go deep down into those dreadful lower vital regions and mix in there, play in there. Our mind is not only pure and good, it enjoys all kinds of experiences. Is it clear? Anybody would like to ask anything? Here it is, the mind. What is the meaning of tempers? To, to tamper means to interfere with something. If you keep your things very neat and tidy and you come home and something's been moved, you will say, oh, somebody's been tampering with my things, interfering. No? So in the same way, the mind can go and interfere with what's going on in those lower levels of consciousness. Mm -hmm. The ethereal force means Yes. In the ether, yes, the ether is the subtlest form of um, 
atmosphere of, of substance and what is ethereal belongs to that atmosphere. So mind is a bit like that, it's ethereal, no? It is, it is not tied down by these heavier forms of substance. It can uh, go on his ethereal course in the subtle atmosphere. Um, Suresh, you will notice this word subtle, we spell it with a B, S-U-B-T-L-E, but the B is silent, we don't pronounce it. Subtle, subtle, yeah. yeah. Bhuvana, what do you read? This is the living surface of man's life. He is this and he is all the universe. He scales the unseen. He depths than the abyss. A whole mysterious world is brought to him. Mm. So that mind <clears throat> is the surface mind. You know, that mind that goes traveling and only a moment spends in silent self. And that is, we can say, that represents the surface of our human life. And it's only a very small surface, although it seems so vast, all this inner journeying that it can do. But this mind, this uh, regent mind, is only the little surface of man's life. He is this, but he is also much more. He is all the universe. Man is what we call the microcosm. He represents a small representation of the whole manifestation. It's all contained within us. That's why we can have access to all the different levels of it. So now I think when it says he, it has changed. It's not the mind, it is man. Man, the human being. He is this and he's all the universe. So he can scale, he can climb up to the unseen, the invisible. We scale a mountain or um, uh, people even climb, scale buildings. No? They climb up it. Hmm? to scale. And his deeper parts, his depths, dare the abyss. In a physical sense, the abyss is the deepest part of the ocean. There are very, very deep places in, uh, beneath the sea. That's the abyss. But when he writes it like this, with a capital A, he means the abyss of the universe, the very, very deepest, darkest levels of the universe. So it uh, requires some courage to go there, to dare. If you dare to do something, you have courage. So a whole mysterious world is locked up within, within every human being. We have this surface that we, uh, we are aware of, but locked up within us are always a whole mysterious world that usually we don't contact, we don't know about. The, the mysterious world is locked within the man. Within us, yes. Within all of us, yes. Uh, Tatiana, would you read? Unknown to himself, he lives a hidden thing behind which faithless things in the world will be close. An epicure and the spirit's unseen joys, he lives on the sweet home of solitude. Yes, we'll pause there. So, this is repeating the idea, unknown to himself. Every human being is unknown to themselves. Really, our true self is living within. That true self is the one 
who is the king who should be the ruler of our nature but that king is hidden and he's just allowing the, the regent to rule in his place and deal with the outer nature. You know, the king remains hidden within. He lives behind rich tapestries in great secret rooms. In the olden days, people, the uh, kings, wealthy people, they used to um, hang on the walls of the, the bare stone walls of their castles, wonderful woven pictures for perhaps 500 years. That was the finest, the highest form of art in Europe, was the art of weaving these beautiful pictures which the wealthy people would hang on the walls of their rooms. So those tapestries would keep the rooms quiet and warm and um, they would be, the people would be surrounded by all these wonderful pictures. So our soul is living inside us like that, surrounded by <coughs> all these wonderful pictures, protected. Nobody even knows that he's there. No? In these great secret rooms. And he is an epicure. An epicure is somebody who um, lives for pleasure, lives for delight. Somebody who enjoys uh, uh, the, um, all the delights of the senses, the aesthetic sense. So the soul is an epicure, one who enjoys the spirit's unseen joys, the secret joys and delights of the spirit. Very, very different from what a, an outer epicure enjoys, uh, music and paintings and good food and uh, nice clothes and all these things. No? He lives on the sweet honey of solitude. That is his food. Honey, this lovely honey, it's like Amrita. It's like the food that makes you immortal. That is how he nourishes himself, on that sweet honey, that delight of being alone, solitude the state of being alone. When you say our soul, who is this our, this me? Human beings. Mm -hmm. this, because he's speaking about man. Yeah. He said this is the little surface of man's life. I think man is, so is the man. Yes, that's why he says he, um, unknown to himself, he lives a hidden king. So the soul is really the man. Hmm? So when we, when we say we have a soul, we mean the, the soul and instrumental part, life, uh, mind, God, all together. But here he's not speaking not about here, the actually, life. In the morning when I read, I had this, this question. Who, yes. We have a soul. Our, yeah. Well, Sri Aurobindo says actually, to be more accurate, we should say we are a soul, yeah. not that we have a soul. Mm -hmm. And that soul of ours has uh, a body and a life and a mind and all these capacities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we are the soul. And really. Nature parts. That, that, that is the truth of us, mm -hmm. but it's not the way that we live. It's not the way that we are conscious of being. That's why we identify ourselves with the mind, with the outer personality. And say we have a soul. And then we because say, we are the soul. yes, exactly. But here he's describing what it's like for the soul. The soul lives in that whole mysterious world within. And there he is, and we are not aware of him. And he's enjoying that being secret for the time being. No? When he wants to come out and rule the being, he will do it. 
but for the time being he is enjoying this being secret and hidden and putting the mind in front to rule our lives instead. So now um, When I'm reading this line, I always think of Sri Aurobindo or the ashram when he was sitting there. Sitting there, a hidden king. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that one within that hidden king, um, that's the he in the next <coughs> sentence. Um, Maggie, would you read? Mm, so this is uh, continuing this picture of some secret inhabitant living hidden within. Mm? He, he's divine, he's a god, but he doesn't have a name. And he lives in a fane, in a shrine, a sacred uh, dwelling place. But it's unapproachable. It's very difficult to reach that place where the nameless God is dwelling. He's dwelling in the secret <coughs> additum of his inmost soul. So there, there are different levels of soul also, but in the very innermost center, that's where that nameless God is living, in the secret additum. It, it's a Latin word. It actually just means the place within, but it's used for the most sacred place in the church or the temple the most sacred and secret place. So there he is, that's where he is keeping safe, he's guarding the mysteries of the being, the true being. No? All the mysterious secrets that it has, he keeps them beneath the threshold the threshold is the door sill we have to cross when we enter the house, cross the threshold. But we, there is also a threshold of consciousness. We say uh, the, the word for the threshold in Latin is limen. And when we cross the threshold, we go into the subliminal what's beyond the threshold of consciousness. Mm. So underneath that threshold or behind shadowy gates, there are gates that can be locked, dim shadowy gates. Or there are cellars. The cellars are underneath the house in the, in the foundations. There are these rooms, storerooms often, no? where we lock away things. Vast cellars. In our consciousness, there are underground rooms like that, where we keep things stored in inconscient sleep. We put the things away there, they're sleeping, and we even forget that they are there. We are not aware of them at all. So that's where the secrets of the being, of existence, are kept hidden in us. So we only see the surfaces of things. Uh, Dana Lakshmi. The Immaculate Divine, all wonderful, casts into the purity of his soul. His splendor and his greatness and the life of self-creation 
in time infinity, as into a sublimely mirror in glass. Man in the world's life works out the dreams of God. Yes. Immaculate. It means absolutely pure, without any stain or mark or imperfection. So the divine, all-wonderful, the Supreme Lord, who is immaculate, puts something of himself into the individual soul of the human being. You know? To cast means to throw, but it's throwing like a farmer throws the seed. He will cast something like that. So the Supreme Lord is casting into the, the human soul, into the silver purity of his soul. Argent is the French word meaning silver. He throws, he sends, uh, casts seeds of the, the splendor and the greatness of the Supreme Lord, of his power and his glory. Uh, seeds of that are uh, cast into our souls. And also the Supreme Divine uh, throws there the light of self creation in time's infinity. The supreme light is the light of consciousness, of all consciousness. That all consciousness We can say Satchitananda, the supreme existence, consciousness, and bliss. <clears throat> creating the universe, creating space and time, mm -hmm. casts some of its own light to inhabit all this. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a self-creation. It's expressing all its uh, potentialities and possibilities, throwing them out of itself into a world, our world. Mm -hmm. So that light of self-creation <coughs> is coming into our souls. The soul is hidden in this unapproachable fane, but secretly it's influencing our lives. And so our lives and what happens to us, our future, all this is created by a kind of interaction between that seed which is within and then what is happening outside of the play of nature which is also a divine play, but it's an unconscious play. That self-creation, the conscious self-creation is coming from within, from the soul. In many places, I don't mean in South Asia, mm. you come, come out of the place, silver purity. Yes. How is it silver? Connected silver with purity. purity. Mm. I think perhaps the connection is with moonlight. You know, there's an idea of moonlight being very yes. purifying and cooling and soothing. Moonlight is also compared to silver. Yes, it's a kind of silvery light, isn't yeah. it? Of course, silver is not gold. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, that gold has a different kind of purity. Uh, silver. Gold is also purity. Yes. Is also so I think the thing about the moon and the silver light of the moon is that it's a reflected light. It's not the direct source of the light itself. The sun is golden. 
That's where the light comes from. No? So that's why the, the color of the truth consciousness is golden. But its reflection in us, it is silver. Hmm? Maybe that's a way of thinking about it. Uh, I'm thinking here, I mean, we shouldn't be too literal about these things, but here it seems as if the individual soul is the reflection of the divine sun, the, the immaculate, all wonderful. No? There's the, here there's a reflection of that. But don't take it too literally. The, in the levels of consciousness, the moon is the symbol of the overmind, which is the, the highest level of consciousness normally that human beings could reach. And that's reflecting the divine light of the, the supermind, the truth light. Hmm? Sun is the symbol of supermind. Sun. The sun is actually the symbol of the full divine consciousness, power, bliss, everything, no? energy. Everything comes from the sun. But the supermind has something of that light. It's a, a, a channel or agent of that full sunlight. And then there's this last wonderful line, man in the world's life works out the dreams of God. That's what we human beings are doing, whether we know it or we don't know it. Usually we don't know it. Hmm? But that's what we are here for. That's what these uh, evolving conscious beings are here for. That's what our souls have accepted to come here and live under the domination of matter in order to work out in the life of the, of the evolving universe the dreams of God. Each of us is a center, that's the truth of us. But we are some kind of center for God's working. And if we consciously become that, then we can become very, very effective instruments for his work. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> he just does what he can with us, <laughs> these crude tools. No. Now I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip to page 482 to line 300. <laughs> If you have a glance at these pages, you will see why. It's all very, very unpleasant and very difficult to understand. And since we are concentrating on the English, I don't think we need to go through all that. But that is part of what Savitri sees when she's shown this vision of the past and of how things are. But I think we really don't need to go to all through. Demons and titans. And demons yes, and um, everything. Terrible. Yes. So we, we'll skip that. So who's the next one to read, Omar? Hmm? Oh, the Mm. So, this, is, this continues from this idea that man in the world's life works out the dreams of God. No? All the world's possibilities are within humanity, within human beings, just like a tree in that little seed. Hmm? All the possibilities of the tree are there in that little seed. Within us there's a seed for the whole 
all the possibilities of the world. All the world's possibilities in man are waiting as the tree waits in its seed. So our own past lives in us. Our individual past, but also the past of humanity. And that past is actually driving the speed of our future. Pace is the, uh, the way that you move. And what we do now is shaping what will happen to us in the future. His presence acts, what we do now in the present, fashion, give shape to his coming fate, what, will, what we will have to experience in the future. Sri often refers to our body as the house. The body is the house in which our life being lives, our mind being lives, our soul lives. Hiding in this house, each of us has an individual house, um, are the unborn gods. The gods are the the cosmic powers. And there are cosmic powers who haven't been who haven't manifested yet, who are unborn in that sense. But there's another sense in which they are unborn. They are unborn because they are immortal. They don't have to be born and they don't have to die. So these are immortal, everlasting powers. They are hiding in us, but they're also unborn in the sense that they haven't manifested yet in the material universe. <laughs> I don't know this young lady's name. Universe, yeah, thank you. Demons. We know the word demons, which is spelt just with an E. No? When we put this E in there, it means that we are thinking of the original Greek meaning of the word, which is a spirit, even a good spirit. The philosopher. Uh, when we th think of demons, we think of bad spirits, no? But when we have this spelling, it's not a bad spirit, it's an inspiring spirit, some kind of spirit that lives within us and inspires us. No? The, the great Greek uh, philosopher Socrates spoke of his daemon, and he seems to have been speaking of what we might call uh, his, the psychic being, or some kind of inner guidance which told him what to do. So the spirits, the spirits of the unknown, everything that is not yet known, they uh, cast their shadows over the mind of the human being. They uh, cast, again it's the same idea of casting a seed, their dreams into live molds of thought. Important to grasp the idea of a mold. <coughs> when we want to make a candle, for example, we will first of all create a mold, a shape, into which we can pour that liquid um, wax 
and then it will make a candle. Or if we are cooking, we might do it, no? If we want to make a, a jelly or a, some, something that, or a cake that has a particular shape, when it's still in a liquid shape, we pour it into the mold and then it hardens and we have the right shape. So Shobindo has told us that this life of ours <coughs> is like a mold for the spirit. The spirit is formless. The soul is not bound to any fixed form. One of the purposes of us being uh, here in physical forms with a, a particular life personality and a particular mind personality is to give to soul and spirit molds which it can inhabit and which can give it um, a permanent shape. This is one way in which we help to live out the dreams of God. Hmm? So they, they, these, um, these spirits of the unknown, they are putting their dreams into our mind. And um, they, there they, there are molds which will let those dreams be realized in particular forms. These are the molds with which our mind builds its world. It's a remarkable thing. Mind, we don't know what shape it is or what it looks like, no? But it can shape matter. All these shapes that we see around us have been shaped by mind. No? So our mind, the human mind, is creating around all of us our universe. We'll just go a little further, Mahalingam. All that has been renews in him is birth. All that can be is here in his soul. The feeling in beings is course on the roads of the world, obscured in the interpreting reason and seekers, lines of the secret comfort of the God. Yes. <coughs> So everything that has ever existed gets born again through us human beings. We are carrying the past with us and it influences what we do and think and it gets born again through us. It, uh, all that has been renews in him its birth. It's born again in a new form in us. And everything that can be, all the possibilities, are already figured. There are images of them in the soul of the human being. All the future possibilities. So all that has been and all that can be gets issues in deeds. It gets expressed. It gets put out in action. And those actions, the things that human beings do, create grooves on the roads of the world. When it's rainy, on the clay roads, if we go with our cycle or with a cart, particularly if it's a heavy bullet, bullet cart, it will create grooves, ruts. You know? And then the next people who come that way, they have to follow those ruts. They have no choice. So in that way, our kind of human action is making lines, making tracks, beginning to create habits so that once a thing has been done, other things will follow the same lines. And these tracks, he says, the, the reason, our reason, can't begin to understand what those 
tracks are for. They are obscure, they're mysterious and dark to our reason. Our reason interprets the world for us. It takes the, the information that our senses gives to us and it works out what it means. But it cannot understand these tracks that are happening because of human action. Hmm? But actually those lines, those grooves, are lines of the secret purpose of the gods. The cosmic powers are making us human beings make those tracks and those tracks are leading towards the secret aim and purpose of the universe. <clears throat> so I think we will stop there today. If anybody has any questions, you can ask now. Then we'll read these lines again. I think it's very, very important for us human beings to understand these kind of things. You know, why we are here and the significance of being a human being and our actions and our thoughts and dreams and aspirations in the world. You know, they have a significance. They help to create these lines for the purposes of the divine powers. So we'll go back to line 185 on page 479. We'll read to the bottom of the page and then we'll turn over to page 482 and start again at line 300. <coughs> Adventuring into infinite mind space, he unfolds his wings of thought in inner air. Or travelling in imagination's car, crosses the globe, journeys beneath the stars. To subtle worlds takes his ethereal course, visits the gods, on life's miraculous peaks, communicates with heaven, tampers with hell. This is the little surface of man's life. He is this, and he is all the universe. He scales the unseen, his depths dare the abyss. A whole mysterious world is locked within. Unknown to himself, he lives a hidden king behind rich tapestries in great secret rooms. An epicure of the spirit's unseen joys, he lives on the sweet honey of solitude. A nameless god in an unapproachable fane, in the secret additum of his inmost soul, he guards the being's covered mysteries beneath the threshold behind shadowy gates or shut in vast cellars of inconscient sleep the immaculate divine all wonderful casts into the argent purity of his soul, his splendor and his greatness, and the light of self-creation in time's infinity, 
as into a sublimely mirroring glass. Man in the world's life works out the dreams of God. All the world's possibilities in man are waiting as the tree waits in its seed. His past lives in him, it drives his future's pace. His present's acts fashion his coming fate. The unborn gods hide in his house of life. The diamonds of the unknown overshadow his mind, casting their dreams into live moulds of thought, the moulds in which his mind builds out its world. His mind creates around him its universe. All that has been renews in him its birth. All that can be is figured in his soul. Issuing in deeds, it scores on the roads of the world obscure to the interpreting reason's guess, lines of the secret purpose of the gods. 